they knew what they didn't like and didn't go past that. And that's where much of the country is at. Two-thirds of Americans may reject evolution or doubt it, but they don't have a good idea what it is. At the risk of giving away the ending, there was a winner <laughs> and a loser in this case. Um, those experts who showed up to testify on behalf of intelligent design at the trial, and not all of them did show up, a number bailed out at the last minute. Those that did come did not fare well. The judge on the case unequivocally ruled against the school board and against intelligent design. He found that the board had a religious motive in adopting this policy rather than an academic one and that intelligent design was at root a supernatural idea and science very much limits itself to the natural. He didn't say intelligent design was wrong, he just said it was religious and that though it might be correct, it's not science. And with that, I'll end my prepared remarks and open things up for discussion, questions, and let's see where it goes. Yes? When you speak with people in Kansas and in Seattle and at San Juan Capistrano, um, do you get any sense that minds are being changed, those two-thirds of Americans who reject evolution? Do you, get, or do you feel optimistic at all about the trend? I am optimistic that um, there's, a, there's a, a group of Americans who just aren't very knowledgeable about science or, and specifically evolution, but who are interested and who have an open mind. And perhaps they uh, have religious faith, belong to a church that does not see a conflict between uh, religion and science. And for those individuals, I think it's just a matter of feeling um, uh, comfortable with scientific ideas that they need to become more familiar with. Uh, so, so a part of, I think, the source of this conflict is that our science education in America is not very good. And part of the reason for that is, in the case of evolution, it's such a controversial idea in the public's mind that a significant number of teachers just avoid it or downplay it. The, the irony of Dover was that the evolution lessons the kids were getting there before this controversy started was so watered down and happened at the end of the year when summer was about to start. Half the kids didn't even remember it. And the other half just were scratching their head. Yeah, Darwin, I remember that name. Uh, you know, what did he do? Uh, it, it was not really on their radar screen. And I think that's true in a lot of communities. In, in California, I talked to a teacher from a high school in the LA area, and she said, I'm the only one of five science teachers who even mentions evolution, even though it's mandated by the state. The other ones don't want to go near it. Our community wouldn't stand for it. So although the conflict in Dover arose and became very visible because of a policy change that was done in a very public way, uh, underneath the radar screen, there's all sorts of pressures going on in communities that cause uh, certain scientific ideas like evolution to not be taught very well. So you get, filling that void, an almost cartoon image of evolutionary theory that people find highly objectionable. Uh, but it's put out there by the opponents evolu of evolution, not the scientific community. And that's uh, what people, I think, object to in many cases. Now there's the, those who uh, adhere to a very literalist interpretation of the Bible, and for them, evolution is problematic, as is many other uh, scientific ideas, and, and it's very tough for them to try and recounsel those ideas, and I'm not sure how they can or whether they will do so. Yes? Yeah, did uh, Michael Behe, author of uh, Darwin's Black Box, uh, testify at the uh, yes, he did. Dover trial? Because I understand he, he tries to keep his arguments mainly into the scientific sphere, into the, into specifically into his expertise, which is biochemistry and uh, biochemical systems evolving through evolutionary uh, methods, which he's against. Yes, Michael Behe is a Lehigh University professor, and he um, <laughs> he's... Um, Biochemist, and his he's he's kind of the scientific star of the intelligent design movement. And the um, his idea that he he came up with is called irreducible complexity. It's a mouthful, but basically what it means is that certain structures, according to Behe, in in biology, are so complex and consist of so many parts that they couldn't have evolved 
naturally, that they had to have been designed because their components, he says, uh, perform no function on their own. And so um, natural selection, the force that uh, guides evolutionary process, couldn't act on them. So how'd they get come to be? He calls them molecular machines, and he has these diagrams that show these little cogs and gears and, and things uh, inside cells. Of course, there's nothing like that in it, but it's an illustration. It's a, you know, bits of protoplasm is what he's talking about. But the point remains, is it possible for these complex structures to evolve naturally? B, he says no. And he says, and he's very adamant, that that's a scientific proposition, and in, in, in a way, He's right. It is a scientific problem because it is testable. He hasn't tested it. In fact, he described a test that would test it, and he said, but I, I decided not to do it. It wouldn't be fruitful, was his answer. Now, Behe's cross-examination proved to be a very pivotal moment in this trial. He was, um, I don't think, ready for what uh, the onslaught he faced. His ideas were severely challenged, and by the time he was done, he had to make a number of concessions that did not bode well for intelligent design side in this trial. First, he had to concede that in order for intelligent design to qualify as a scientific theory, the definition of scientific theory had to be broadened to such a point that astrology also counted as a scientific theory. Then he was the claim that he had his idea of irreducible complexity as it was published in Darwin's Black Box, his best-selling book on the subject, he maintained that it had been rigorously peer-reviewed. And it turned out that that peer review uh, consisted of a 10-minute conversation between his publisher and a, a professor at a veterinary school who thought irreducible complexity sounded like a cool idea, but he hadn't actually read the manuscript. That was the peer review, a 10-minute phone conversation. And then he presented a paper which in a hearing in Kansas had been received as proof of intelligent design, a, pa a highly technical paper he had co-authored that, that purported to show that um, unique features in um, bacteria could not evolve quickly enough to, for evolution to explain their existence. And so the uh, attorney, Philadelphia attorney named Eric Rothschild walked him through the numbers on that paper, someone that nobody had ever done before. And the paper ended up showing evolution was supported, exactly the opposite of what Behe maintained it showed, that there was more than sufficient time for the characteristics he was claiming were, uh, uh, could not have arisen through evolution for them to have occurred. So his ideas were really for the first time put to a very rigorous test. and. Um, he came up uh, looking less than the star he had uh, appeared to be when he walked into the room. And uh, he was not the only expert that testified for intelligent design, but he certainly was the, the, the most prominent. Is there another question? Yes. The opponents of evolution, despite their beliefs, uh, do nothing but continue